In Westfield, New Jersey, behind the stately doors of a luxurious mansion, a shocking secret lay dormant. John List, a devout father and husband, led what appeared to be the ideal suburban life with his wife, Helen, their three children, and his elderly mother. Yet, beneath this perfect image, a brewing turmoil was about to spiral into a dark abyss from which there was no return. In November 1971, the unimaginable happened. The entire List family was brutally murdered, and the perpetrator vanished into thin air, leaving behind a mystery that would baffle authorities for nearly two decades. What was the real motive behind this horrifying act? And how did an ordinary man mastermind one of the most infamous disappearances in American history? To understand the tragedy of Breeze Knoll, we must journey back to the origins of its central figure, John List. Born in 1925 in Bay City, Michigan, to German-American parents, John's upbringing was steeped in a strict Lutheran faith, a doctrine that would dictate much of his life's path. John grew in the shadow of a domineering father and the weight of religious expectation. His home life was devoid of warmth and affection, replaced instead with rigid discipline and the demand for perfection. Seeking escape and perhaps a sense of purpose, List served as a laboratory technician in the Army during World War II. In 1944, his father died. After List was discharged in 1946, his return to civilian life saw him armed with a degree in accounting, a profession that prized the order and control he had long been conditioned to uphold. In 1950, he re-enlisted to fight in the Korean War. At Fort Eustis in Virginia, he met 24-year-old Helen Morris Taylor, a widow with a daughter, Brenda. Her husband was killed in action in Korea. Helen became the first woman of 26-year-old List. In 1951, John married her. The union, blessed under the eyes of God, was expected to be the foundation of John's ideal family. But beneath the surface, cracks began to form, revealing the dark side of the American dream. Helen's battle with alcoholism and a diagnosis of tertiary syphilis, a secret she kept from John until after their marriage, planted seeds of betrayal and resentment. This disease made her nearly blind. Helen's disability prevented her from walking, and she mostly stayed in bed. The couple had three children together, Patricia, John Jr., and Frederick. In 1960, List's stepdaughter Brenda got married and left their house. John was vice president and controller in a bank and also Sunday school teacher at the local church. The family never missed a service. To the outside world, they were a picture-perfect family. Yet, John's inability to reconcile the imperfections of his family life with the unattainable standards set by his faith and upbringing foreshadowed a silent storm brewing on the horizon. 1965 marked a turning point for the Lists as they moved into Breeze Knoll, a 19-room Victorian mansion with marble fireplaces and a Tiffany skylight in Westfield, New Jersey. It was a grand statement, but its upkeep put a strain on John's finances, further exacerbating the pressure he felt to provide and maintain the facade of success. It was the most expensive house in Westfield at the time, and the family could not fully furnish it. List's neighbors said he was cold and reserved. Sometimes they saw John mowing his lawn in a full suit and tie. His marriage was probably unhappy. The family's Lutheran pastor overheard Helen saying to John, If you were half the man my first husband was, we wouldn't be having the troubles we're having. John's professional life was marked by frequent changes and failures, a stark contrast to the image of stability he desperately sought to project. In 1971, at the age of 46, John List lost his position at the bank. The job loss was a personal humiliation, a failure not only as a provider but as a man worthy of respect and admiration. His efforts to find another employment were unsuccessful. The thought of informing his family about the loss of income seemed unbearable. He dressed for work every morning and spent his days at the train station reading newspapers and covertly withdrew funds from his mother's bank accounts to cover the mortgage. List declined to seek welfare assistance, fearing the humiliating shame it would bring upon him in the community and contravening the values of self-reliance instilled in him by his father. The psychological portrait of John List that emerges is one of a man at war with himself torn between the dogmatic beliefs of his upbringing and the realities of his faltering life, John was walking a tightrope of his own making. The chasm between the ideal and the real was widening, pushing him to the brink. 
As winter's chill enveloped the town of Westfield, a shroud of mystery began to unfurl around the stately List mansion. What lay within its walls was a secret so dark it would chill the bones of a community. Days turned to weeks since anyone had seen John List or his family. Neighbors grew concerned, lights in the mansion burned day and night, yet its inhabitants seemed to have vanished into thin air. The once meticulous lawn now lay unkempt, a silent testament to the abnormality of the situation. Finally, light bulbs started burning out one by one. December 7, 1971, marked the day the silence was broken. Police, responding to concerned calls, entered Breeze Knoll. Nothing could have prepared them for the scene that awaited. Organ church music was playing in the cold house as the heating had been turned off. In the mansion's ballroom, the lifeless bodies of the List family were found, each meticulously laid out. John's wife, Helen, their three children, Patricia, John Jr., Frederick, and his mother, Alma, had all been shot. It was a methodical execution, a chillingly orchestrated end to a family. On November 9, 1971, List dropped the children off at school. He returned home around 9 a.m. and got two old handguns from his garage. While his children were at school, he entered the kitchen where his 47-year-old wife Helen was having toast and sipping her morning coffee. He shot her in the back of her head. Then he went upstairs to his 84-year-old mother's room on the third floor. She was making toast. Greeting him with a kiss, she asked him about the loud noise. List said he didn't know and shot her in the face. Like Judas, I gave her a kiss, he remarked later. Then he dragged his wife's body to the ballroom, mopped the floor in the kitchen, and ate a sandwich waiting for his children. In his memoir, List wrote that he had to mop the floor three or four times, and because they had no mop ringer, he had to ring it by hand. He confessed that he experienced no qualms or feelings of remorse. His 16-year-old daughter, Patricia, and 13-year-old son, Frederick, arrived home from school. List shot each of them in the back of the head. I approached all of them from behind so they wouldn't realize at the last moment what I was going to do to them, he said later. After it was all over, I said some prayers for them all. From the hymn book, that was the least that I could do. He said he had to kill his mother because the other deaths would have been a tremendous shock to her. After that, List had lunch and drove to the post office and then to his bank to close both his and his mother's bank accounts. Later, he drove to Westfield High School to watch his 15-year-old son, John, play in a soccer game. He drove him home where he shot him 10 times. Evidence of a misfire indicated that his son tried to defend himself. He also didn't die at once, hence List shot multiple times. I didn't want him to suffer, he said later. He sent notes to the children's schools and part-time jobs saying that the children would be visiting their ill grandmother in North Carolina for a few weeks. Milk, mail, and newspaper deliveries were stopped by him. List arranged the bodies of his wife and children on sleeping bags in the mansion's ballroom. Their faces were covered with rags. His mother's body was left in her converted apartment in the attic. List slept in the house where his family lay dead then left the next morning. Before leaving, he tuned a radio to a religious station, leaving religious hymns playing in the empty rooms of the house. He explained that the music over the intercom was supposed to deter burglars. When the police discovered the bodies, John List was nowhere to be found. The man who sought control above all had orchestrated his family's demise before vanishing, leaving behind only a haunting letter that attempted to justify the unjustifiable. It was a five-page letter to his pastor. List's letter speaks volumes. It reveals a man who saw himself as a failure, unable to fulfill the roles society and his faith demanded of him. In his mind, murdering his family was a twisted salvation from financial ruin and the moral decay he perceived. In his letter, he said, As I was doing it, I knew it was wrong. But as he was broke, he didn't want to subject his children to poverty and the shame of losing their mansion. He also said he saw too much evil in the world, and he had killed his family to save their souls. He was afraid that his family, confronted with a world full of evil and poverty, would turn from God. To his mind, this was the only way to ensure their safe arrival in heaven. He said, I finally decided that the only way to save them from that was to kill them. He wrote that his family was turning away from God and would ultimately spend eternity in hell for their sins because his wife Helen had stopped going to church. 
Moreover, his teenage daughter Patty desired to become an actress. I'm sure many will say, how can anyone do such a horrible thing? My only answer is it isn't easy and was only done after much thought. At the end of the letter, he wrote, Mother is in the hallway in the attic, third floor. She was too heavy to move. List's letter offered a window into a fractured mind. His actions suggested a delusional belief system. His need for control and perfection, coupled with deep religious convictions, warped into a justification for his unfathomable choice. The discovery of the List murders sent shockwaves through Westfield. One of the first officers who saw the bodies, Robert Kenny said, After 28 years as a police officer and 14 as an investigator, you see everything. But this was unique. The mystery of John List's disappearance would confound authorities for nearly two decades. But as the manhunt stretched on, the legend of John List grew, a ghostly figure who had slipped through the cracks of a society he could no longer face. With the grim discovery inside Breeze Knoll, the quiet town of Westfield found itself at the epicenter of a horrifying mystery. The investigation into the List family murders unfolded like a puzzle missing crucial pieces. Each room of the mansion told a part of the story, but the narrator of this tragic tale was conspicuously absent. As the manhunt for John List began, investigators faced the daunting task of tracking a man who seemed to have evaporated. Meanwhile, the public grappled with the duality of a devout churchgoer and a cold-blooded killer. List had planned his escape meticulously, cleaning the crime scenes, cutting himself out of every family photo with scissors, severing ties, and leaving no trace. He burned the photos along with his passport in his Weber grill. In an era before digital footprints, List vanished into the ether. The FBI found his car parked at Kennedy International Airport in New York, but there was no trace of him. The police investigated hundreds of leads without success. In August 1972, nine months after the murder, Breeze Knoll stood empty until it was mysteriously destroyed by fire. There were rumors that the house was cursed. Despite being officially deemed arson, no suspects have been identified. The fire also consumed the mansion's ballroom-stained glass skylight, believed to be a signed Tiffany original and valued at around $100,000 at that time, which would be approximately $700,000 today. Selling the ceiling would have allowed List to pay off his debts. By 1974, a new house had been constructed on the property. The absence of technology in 1970s was a cloak of invisibility for List. His identity was erased. For List, it was a desperate bid for survival a twisted form of self-preservation that made him abandon his name, his history, and his crimes. Assuming the name Robert Peter Clark, List started anew in Denver, Colorado. Here, he melded into the fabric of society, unnoticed. For List, integrating into a new life was simpler in a city like Denver, which during the 1970s saw a significant number of people relocating from the East Coast. He grew a mustache, swapped his suits for casual clothes, and took to wearing a cap, yet made no significant effort to alter his appearance further. He first worked as a chef at a Holiday Inn, and between 1979 and 1986, he worked as the controller for a paper box manufacturing company located just outside Denver. Adopting a new identity allowed List to compartmentalize his guilt and live outwardly as a regular citizen. Yet, beneath the surface, the burden of his past life lingered, a specter only he could see. List's new life was a mirror of the old, minus the family he had destroyed. He worked in accounting, remarried, and maintained a facade of devout faith. He became a member of a Lutheran church and organized a carpool for congregants without transport. At a church event, he encountered 35-year-old divorcee Dolores Miller, an Army PX clerk, and they married in 1985. He told her his first wife had died of cancer and moved into her apartment in Aurora, Colorado, situated 10 miles east of Denver. In February 1988, the couple moved to a house in the Brander Mill neighborhood of Midlothian, Virginia. There, List continued his career in accounting at a small firm. For nearly two decades, John List, now Bob Clark, believed he had outsmarted the world and committed the perfect crime. He let his guard down, losing his mustache. But as the 18th anniversary of the murders approached, a television show was about to shatter his illusion of freedom. On May 21, 1989, a pivotal episode of America's Most Wanted aired, 
turning the tide in one of the most baffling manhunts in American history. The decision to feature List on the show was a gamble. With few leads and fading memories, the case had grown cold. But America's Most Wanted had a secret weapon, an age-progressed clay sculpture of List, crafted by forensic artist Frank Bender. Psychologists speculated that List might wear spectacles similar to those he wore in his youth, as a reminder of more successful days. Bender's creation was eerily prescient. He envisioned List with glasses and a receding hairline, a testament to the power of forensic artistry. An audience of 22 million saw the sculpture. When the episode aired, the phone lines lit up. On that evening, a man known as Robert Clark was present at a church event in Midlothian, Virginia. Meanwhile, several of his acquaintances were at their homes, contacting the hotline established by America's Most Wanted. They identified their reserved friend and neighbor as the individual who had horrifically murdered his family years earlier. At the same time, people from Golden, Colorado, were reaching out to the same hotline, asserting that John List and Robert Clark, the local French fry cook who had recently moved to Virginia, were indeed the same person. An old friend of Dolores recognized the man on TV and also made a call. One tip came from List's next-door neighbor. According to her, the resemblance was striking. She said her neighbor was also an accountant and attended church. The viewer's tips led authorities to Virginia. The confrontation was the culmination of years of evasion, a moment when List's meticulously constructed world came crashing down. FBI agents knocked on the door of the shared home of Dolores and Robert Clark. Dolores answered, but her husband was at work. She showed them two photos, one from their wedding day, which were the spitting image of the bust. One officer stayed with her while the other rushed to List's accounting firm where he was apprehended. The arrest of List, who had been a pillar of respectability to the outside world, was a shock. FBI agent Kevin August said, He was a strange man, I would say. He was not very animated. That's the best way to put it. He seemed to me as a vessel, with no soul in there. When driving List to the police station, August asked, What kind of man are you, that you killed your mother, your wife, and your children, and then assumed another identity and married another woman who has no idea who you are? List said nothing, but a single tear rolled down his eye. List maintained his assumed identity for months after being extradited back to Union County, New Jersey, in 1989. However, on February 16, 1990, when confronted with undeniable proof, including fingerprints matching those in his military records and crime scene evidence, he admitted to his real identity. In custody, List confessed to the murders, citing financial ruin and a twisted belief that killing his family was a merciful act, sparing them the shame of poverty. But there were deeper issues at play. List's need for control, his rigid moralism, and his inability to face failure. His actions, though unfathomable, were a twisted solution to an unsolvable problem in his mind. Expert psychologists also believed that List was going through a midlife crisis. The prosecution pointed out that was no excuse for killing five innocent people. A court-appointed psychiatrist determined that List suffered from obsessive-compulsive personality disorder, believing his only options were either to accept welfare, which he deemed unacceptable due to the potential for public ridicule, and the contradiction of his father's principles regarding the care and protection of family members, or to kill his family, ensuring their ascent to heaven. Alan Goldstein, who examined List for the defense, said, It wasn't as if he didn't have a conscience. If anything, his conscience was too bright. He felt responsible for saving souls. His wife couldn't believe that List was a mass murderer. She said, I love my husband very deeply. I cannot believe this is the same man. Later, List confessed to his wife, sobbing and saying to her, I was always such a kind, gentle man, except for that one act. John List's capture closed a long-standing chapter of mystery and horror, but it also opened a window into the mind of a killer, revealing the dark corners where rationality warps into madness. The trial of John List unfolded in a Union County courthouse. Defense lawyers depicted List as someone deeply affected by a religious upbringing enforced by his parents, which, they argued, drove him to madness. However, the jury was unconvinced. Throughout the trial, the emotionless tone of List's letters, his clearly planned escape strategies, and his lack of remorse, maintaining he acted as the savior rather than the murderer of his family, resulted in his conviction. During his trial, 
List testified that his financial difficulties reached crisis level in 1971, following his job loss due to the shutdown of the Jersey City Bank. To hide this embarrassing fact from his family, he maintained his usual routines. Over time, the family's financial situation became worse, leading List to encourage his children to find part-time work under the guise of teaching them responsibility, though it was actually a strategy to aid the family's finances. Furthermore, he struggled with his wife Helen's alcohol dependency and her undisclosed tertiary syphilis, which she had hidden for 18 years after contracting it from her first husband. Helen had manipulated List into marrying her by falsely claiming pregnancy, then insisted on a Maryland wedding to avoid states that required syphilis testing before marriage. At the time, a premarital syphilis test was mandated in most other states. Her condition deteriorated over the years. She didn't say anything about that to List, but a thorough examination revealed the condition in 1969. Eventually, her disease, together with her excessive drinking, transformed her into an unkempt and paranoid recluse who would often humiliate List in public, comparing him unfavorably to her first husband in bed. John List's actions were a cataclysmic culmination of years of internal and external pressures, financial despair, a crumbling facade of familial perfection, and a rigid, punitive religious upbringing coalesced into a devastating breakdown of his moral and psychological boundaries. Witness after witness painted a portrait of a man at odds with reality. Yet, it was List's own letters and the chilling confession tape played for the jury that offered the most haunting insights into his psyche. In his confession, List spoke with a chilling calmness, claiming financial ruin and a misguided attempt to save his family's souls as his motives. But beneath this veneer of rationalization lurked deeper, darker struggles. When the verdict came, it was unanimous guilty on all counts. On April 12, 1990, List was found guilty on five counts of first-degree murder. During his sentencing hearing, he refused to fully accept blame, stating, I feel that because of my mental state at the time, I was unaccountable for what happened. I ask all affected by this for their forgiveness, understanding, and prayer. However, the judge firmly disagreed, declaring, John List is without remorse and without honor, he said. After 18 years, 5 months, and 22 days, it is now time for the voices of Helen, Alma, Patricia, Frederick, and John List to rise from the grave. List received the maximum sentence allowed then, five consecutive life terms. List appealed his conviction, citing post-traumatic stress disorder from his military experience as impairing his judgment and claiming the letter found at the crime scene, which was essentially a confession, should be considered a confidential message to his pastor and not admissible in court. These appeals were dismissed by a federal appeals court. Years later, List admitted some regret for his actions in a 2002 interview with Connie Chung, saying, I wish I had never done what I did. I've regretted my action and prayed for forgiveness ever since. Regarding why he didn't take his own life, he believed it would have prevented him from going to heaven, where he hoped to be reunited with his family. So eventually I got to the point where I felt that I could kill them. Hopefully, they would go to heaven, and then maybe I would have a chance to later confess my sins to God and get forgiveness. He also said, when we get to heaven, they'll either have forgiven me or won't realize what had happened. I'm sure that if we recognize each other, we'll like each other's company just like we did here when times were better. List passed away at the age of 82 from pneumonia complications on March 21, 2008, in prison at St. Francis Medical Center in Trenton, New Jersey. John List's case became a cornerstone in the study of family annihilators, offering insights into the mind of a killer who operates under the guise of protector, driven by twisted logic and profound psychological distress. Thank you for joining me on True Crime Case Files. To my viewers, your thirst for understanding these complex narratives keeps me driven. Please, share your thoughts in the comments. For more deep dives into the challenging mysteries and captivating true crime stories, subscribe to my channel. In the next episode, I'll uncover another chilling case that awaits its turn in the spotlight. Not to miss it, hit the bell for notifications and be part of the journey through the unexplored paths of true crime. See you next time.